little bit about your background coming into this role, um, and I know that you also have roots in Western North Carolina, so tell me a little bit about that. Well, thank you. It's great to be at one of my homes um, back here in Western North Carolina, where I lived for nearly a decade. Um, my entire academic and professional experience has really been centered on three things, health, science, and public policy. Uh, starting when I was at Brevard College, my senior thesis <laughs> was in uh, public health interventions, actually at the time, smoking in restaurants, and trying to understand the impact of secondhand smoke in restaurants, uh, and, and I did a study of that. But went on, of course, to graduate school in public policy and ended up in DC for nearly a decade, uh, leading uh, very large organizations and working kind of at the height of operational work and public policy work and trying to make those things come together to serve folks. So four years ago, four years ago this week, had the opportunity to come home to North Carolina to lead our behavioral health system, another very large, complex uh, system in the state to, to serve folks uh, in a mission that's very important to me. I know those three things you mentioned, are those your three priorities in this role or is that something different? So my three priorities in this role, um, of course, we're very focused on COVID. We continue to make sure, and, and I'm hopeful, we're coming to a different place. Um, but as I look ahead and think about what we've been doing towards our mission for the health and wellness of the department, um, you know, it's really three things. One, behavioral health, front and center. Um, you know, we cannot have health without behavioral health. It's so essential to whole person health. And coming out of these last uh, two years in the pandemic, everybody's been touched. Everybody has experienced grief and loss. And we need to be able to give folks the tools to cope, to support them. And we've been out in front on behavioral health throughout the pandemic, but we're gonna have to really double down and really think about how to invest in that further. Uh, the second thing uh, is children and families. You know, we've had a generation of children experience trauma um, through this pandemic. Uh, and we know that kids experience this very differently than adults because they don't have the same foundational experiences that give them resiliency. And we also know that uh, essential to healthy children is healthy families. And so uh, looking ahead, uh, we need to do a lot more investing, starting at uh, conception and uh, <clears throat> supporting young mothers and onward into the schools and interventions to help kids cope from both mental health and physical health issues. And third, uh, third priority for me is strong and inclusive workforce. You know, coming out of the pandemic, we're in one of the tightest labor markets that we've ever seen. Uh, and our healthcare workforce has really taken a, a beating. They've been on the front line since the beginning. I'm so grateful for everything that they've done, uh, but we need to invest back in the healthcare workforce for the immediate and for the 10 year plan to make sure that we can have a healthcare for workforce that is meeting the needs of a growing state. The other piece on workforce is that um, you know, we know that employment is an evidence-based strategy for health, right? When people are employed, that gives them access to um, social networks, traditions, lots of things that help promote whole person health overall. Um, and we have a lot of individuals with chronic diseases that are in recovery with disabilities that are left out of that opportunity. And so we need to invest in that and invest in our workforce, our public health workforce, our child care workforce, lots of opportunities to continue to make foundational moves on a healthier North Carolina. And I also wanted to ask you, um, how open of a line of communication do you plan on keeping with Western North Carolina? I know you'd mentioned you've got some visits planned. Yeah, well, I'm pretty much set to be up here almost every month for the next five months. I mean, it's not hard to get me to Western North Carolina. We love it here. Uh, I lived uh, here for about a decade down in Brevard, and uh, and so being back to see friends and family members, but, but also, of course, meeting with the partners, um, our local elected officials, uh, our legislative leaders, um, from Raleigh that live here um, on their turf to understand what's happening. You know, it's important to me that we serve all of North Carolina. You know, when I have been out in Cherokee in the past, you know, they remind me that um, folks who live in Cherokee are closer to Atlanta than they are to Asheville. And so we have to really meet people where they are. Uh, and key to increasing access to healthcare is really thinking about rural access. You know, last uh, week I had the opportunity to join the governor at a um, opening for a new behavioral health mobile clinic. Uh, we need to invest in strategies like that in the West as well to make sure that we can continue to keep people access to care everywhere. I think you know rural access to healthcare is a really big uh, point of interest around here, especially because you know we've got a, a lot of healthcare facilities consolidating. Um, you know, a lot of people, if they need a certain level of care, they have to come here to Asheville, even if they live two hours you know west of us. 
Um, so I think that is, would that be a big point of focus for you? Yeah, you know, we have got to make sure that people have access to the full scope of care that they need. And it's not just at the hospital, it's in outpatient settings and it's in other settings as well. We want you know, to get the real value out of healthcare. We wanna be organizing our system so that people get the right care at the right time in the right setting. Uh, but foundational for us to do that is going to be increasing the number of people who have coverage. We have so many individuals without health insurance, which means that they don't have the ability to go to the doctor when they're sick as easily as they have the ability to go to the emergency department. A much higher cost to be, or much higher cost place to be. Uh, and so for us, investing in a healthcare system, getting more value out of it, making people healthier, uh, starts with getting individuals more access to coverage, and that remains a priority for us. Now, I know you worked, um, obviously you've been part of, of Mandy Cohen's team when she was at the helm of NCD HHS. Um, you know, what do you think we learned uh, shifting to COVID? What do you think we learned about the COVID response under her leadership? And how do you think your leadership will compare or contrast to hers? I am so proud of our team. I mean, when I look around, you know, the number of people on our team that are still here today and still 100% committed to North Carolina, frankly, is much larger than when I look at other states. I mean, they've had a lot of turnover in other places, and people in North Carolina at the Department of Health and Human Services are committed to North Carolina. Um, and we've got a team of people. It takes a really diverse team of folks to respond to a pandemic. It takes um, data scientists. It takes communications professionals. It takes attorneys. It takes epidemiologists and specialists across a whole scope of different um, medical experiences and clinical capacities. You know, the, my job is to take the best of all of that to meet the moment to set strategic public policy. And that's really where my expertise is over the last decade, leading public policy at the highest levels of government in a variety of roles in very complex operational environments. Uh, and so we're going to stay focused on that. Of course, right now we're in a much better place on COVID than we were two months ago, or two, especially two years ago. Uh, and so I'm excited for the road ahead as we get to kind of chart a path back to what normality looks like, but then also keep focused on the foundational things we need to do around improving the health and wellness of North Carolina. And I think probably the next few questions will probably just all be COVID related. So we're kind of just going to dive into that now. So um, obviously a lot of big news on mask policies came down last week. Uh, lots of school districts in our area are dropping their mask requirements. Buncombe County actually just dropped its last week. Is that a good thing? You know, we're in a very different place in the pandemic now than we were two months ago or, you know, two years ago, of course. We have tools that give us so many more options, which is great. First and foremost being vaccines and boosters. Staying up to date with your vaccination incredibly decreases your risk of severe disease leading to hospitalization or death. That's a tool that we didn't have. The number of people that have made good use of that tool means that we have the number of people with immunity that allows us to be in a very different place now. We also have increasing access to treatment. We have increasing access to testing and so many other ways that people can protect themselves. Masks are great, um, but we're at a place now where individuals can be wear a mask in settings where they want to wear a mask uh, and, and not necessarily need to wear it everywhere that they go. There's always gonna be high risk settings. Think about healthcare or hospital um, where we're gonna to need to have a different approach and different posture to protect those individuals, but uh, we can be in a much different place now and it's good that we can begin to move ahead um, and give people the tools and an understanding of those tools on how to protect themselves. Now we have seen vaccination rates kind of come to a standstill in North Carolina. I think we've been around 60% of the total, total population vaccinated for a few weeks now. A lot of local health officials saying mostly the vaccines they're administering now are second doses or boosters. First doses are slowing to a crawl. Do you have any plans for trying to get those numbers up in terms of vaccinating the unvaccinated? Well, you know, we're going to continue to make sure that vaccines are easy and everywhere. Uh, we've been pushing forward on an effort to make sure that there's a vial in every fridge or in every shelf uh, so that as you're having conversations with your doctor at your annual checkup or maybe the next time you pass the pharmacy when you're on your <laughs> visit to Ingalls, you'll be like, this is the time where I'm going to do it. Uh, and we, we knew that this is going to be a hard time where it's going to take a lot of conversations. And I would really encourage everyone to have conversations with your neighbors, with your